I'm the designer at Travis VR. Uh, we have a few builders in here, so that's kind of cool because I like seeing my fellow builders. And as a remote company, I don't often get to see them. Uh, professionally, I'm a visual UI, UX, print, branding, and everything in between designer. I've been working in tech for the past six years, and I'm actually about to celebrate three years at Travis, which is pretty exciting. Um, I love speaking at conferences and engaging with developers on topics of design. This talk, as PJ mentioned, is going to be a little bit different. What I've just told you are my accomplishments. What I failed to mention is that I suffer from bulimia, general anxiety, depression. Before we really get started, I wanted to give a trigger warning. This talk will contain topics on eating disorders, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, suicide, and self-harm. If any of those topics make you uncomfortable, feel free to leave. I won't be offended. For those of you who are going to stick around, please give this talk your attention and keep an open mind. Some of what I'll be speaking of are facts and figures around eating disorders. Other parts will be my own personal experience with my disorder, as well as a few monologues. This talk isn't meant to be a go-all for everybody who suffers from eating disorders. It's just my personal experience, and this isn't meant to go over everybody who suffers from them. Some of you out here might have experienced some of what I'll be talking about. However, I believe probably a bigger majority of this audience have not. What I hope that you'll get out of this talk is a better understanding of what eating disorders are, who they affect, and what it's like to live your life with these disorders. I want you to leave this talk having gained empathy and a bit of understanding of what they're like and the people who struggle through them. I'm sure there's probably a few people in here wondering why I talk on eating disorders at a technical conference. I think in the tech industry we've gotten a lot better about having discussions relating to mental health. That's pretty fantastic and I would love to see those conversations continue to grow in popularity. <clears throat> we've heard from people at various events and online media on dealing with burnout, anxiety and depression, but one topic I never hear about is eating disorders. And I think this is due in part to the fact that while we've gotten better about speaking about mental health, it's still a fairly taboo topic, and these conversations are happening in whispers between close friends and colleagues. I believe only when we start talking about these mental health topics, health being the operative word, can we truly start making a difference in our community and in the world. Pure white to the front and each side. It's all I can see. My abdomen is swollen and in need of relief. Finally, a pressure at the back of my throat. The white is met with orange, yellow, and green. Relief has come, but then the tears begin to form. Relief came and went too quickly. Now all I'm left with is regret. I'll never do this again, I tell myself. This makes me feel hollow and empty, and the exhaustion sets in. It's a small part of the ritual thinking I felt during my most recent relapse. I spent two years doing that cycle several times a day. These binges and purges would be carefully managed in my time alone, between work, social engagements, and when I needed to take my prescription medicine. My particular type of disorder is bulimia nervosa. That word comes from the Greek word meaning ravenous hunger. Most people, I think, are probably more familiar with bulimia's counterpart, anorexia nervosa, which stems from the Greek words without appetite. While eating disorders have been around for centuries, mostly among the upper class and the religiously devout, the naming conventions for anorexia and bulimia come from a couple of doctors in the late 1800s who had been seeing patients who had symptoms of disordered eating. A British doctor by the name of William Gull presented a paper to the Royal College of Physicians in 1873. The paper was called Anorexia Hysterica. Around the same time, there was also a doctor in France who published an article on Anorexia Hysterica. Both doctors' naming conventions implied with the use of hyster, which comes from of the womb, that these disorders only affected women. The following year, after there were more cases of eating disorders, the hysterica was dropped in favor of nervosa to show it was a nervous condition and not a female-only affliction. There are different kinds of eating disorders and they're not limited to cisgender women. To give you some 
context about the different medically recognized disorders that are out there, we're going to go over them. Anorexia nervosa is a person with an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat. Someone with anorexia may practice unhealthy behaviors such as restricting calories, only eating specific foods, or skipping meals frequently. These individuals will be underweight, but usually be unable to see that to be the case. Then there's bulimia nervosa, which is the disorder that I suffer from. These people will also be intensely afraid of gaining weight or becoming fat. However, someone with bulimia will eat large amounts of food in a short period, known as a binge, and then eliminate those food or calories, known as a purge. Purging is different with different bulimics. One might induce vomiting, exercise excessively, use laxatives, diuretics, or diet pills to purge those weight for calories. These individuals will probably be at a normal weight or might even be overweight, but also might experience the inability to accurately assess their weight or health. In 2013, there was the addition of binge eating disorder to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This disorder was characterized by individuals who eat large amounts of food rapidly to the point of feeling sick or uncomfortable. These episodes of binging occur frequently, and people who are engaging in these binges often feel that they cannot stop or control how much is eaten. Finally, the DSM-5 has a section known as eating, disorder, eating disorders not otherwise specified. I say that five times really fast. Uh, it's kind of a catch-all for symptoms or disorders that don't fall into the previous three categories. Prior to 2013, binge eating disorder was also listed in the EDNOS category. While eating disorders are often medically characterized by the individual's habits of disordered eating, that's not their only symptom. Eating disorders are often triggered and influenced by external events such as mental factors like stress, anxiety, trauma, depression. Eating disorders are for many individuals a side effect of underlying mental health issues and are used as coping me mechanisms, giving those who are suffering a feeling of control when life might feel otherwise out of control. I was diagnosed with bulimia when I was 19. My parents discovered I'd been losing weight and purging food and admitted me to an outpatient program for people with eating disorders at the Cleveland Clinic. I had some tests done on me at the time and they found my body was severely dehydrated and low on electrolytes, which is pretty common amongst bulimics. But as a young person without a long-standing history of purging, it was thought that I was a good candidate for recovery. I completed my six-week outpatient program and mostly managed to stay on track for about a year before my first relapse during college. That relapse was fairly short-lived and mostly onset by my general stress living out of home for the first time in the dorm. There were a couple of pickups along the next five years, but I managed to live a fairly normal life. As normal as anybody pursuing a demanding art degree can live. Then, in January 2013, I was sexually assaulted at a tech conference, which triggered my longest and most recent relapse. In some ways, I find some solace in knowing that I'm not alone, as sad as that might sound. In the United States alone, 20 million women and 10 million men suffer from a clinically significant eating disorder at some point in their life. That means about 10% of the United States population will feel like I feel. 30 million people, and I'm just one of them. Eating disorders are fairly non-discriminatory. Genetics, environmental factors, and personality traits all work together to create the risk of the godly one. They are not limited to age, race, or gender. Anyone can develop one at any point in their life, though they are more commonly developed at a year of age by young girls. That said, an estimated 10 to 15 percent of people with anorexia and bulimia are male. Among gay men, nearly 14% suffer from bulimia and 20% with anorexia. Transgendered individuals are at the highest risk out of the entire LGBTQ community to develop an eating disorder. Not enough. I still hurt. 
and I'm still angry. A few glasses of wine for breakfast still won't make me happy. The lying, the drinking, the crying. I'm constantly tired. Maybe tomorrow. If I don't eat today, maybe tomorrow. 128.0. constantly anxious and depressed. I began cutting again in late night attacks of anger and confusion. It seemed like my world was falling in on me and my life was spiraling out of control. In an attempt to manage my extreme feelings of self-hatred and my increasing social anxiety, I began to drink heavily. Most people, save for a couple of friends, had no idea how drunk and depressed I was every day. During this time, I somehow managed to move to Germany. Secretly, I hoped I could leave my problems behind in Ohio and create a new life for myself in Berlin. But, as it turns out, your problems have no problem finding you abroad, and Berlin certainly isn't the city to try and bury them in. I worked from home a lot, which was a blessing and a curse. I could structure my day in a way that worked for me. Unfortunately, it also left me with a lot of time. <clears throat> Binging and purging multiple hours a day, I spent my life within the confines of my kitchen and my bathroom. All that time unaccounted for left me with a lot of lies and excuses. And that's the feeling that I hated the most during the whole period. Living one life, but managing intricate fictions of another. Many of the people suffering from eating disorder will struggle with other mental health issues. In the brain, there are several neuro shared neurotransmitters that are believed to be involved in both eating and substance abuse disorders. In regards to substance abuse, about 50% of individuals with an eating disorder will be abusing alcohol and or drugs. That's five times greater than the U.S. general population statistics. For men with binge eating disorder, 57% will suffer from a long life struggle with substance abuse. Although alcohol is high in calories, it's a common substance abuse among those with eating and other mental health issues. Both eating disorders and substance abuse can be used as avoidance-based coping techniques. Obviously, these are ineffective and will leave you more harm than good, leaving emotions unaddressed and potentially escalating issues in personal lives as well as the workplace. This is particularly problematic in the tech industry, where drinking culture is the norm, and it's mainly used as our source of interactions with our colleagues. In addition to those individuals struggling with substance abuse, about 50% of people with an eating disorder will also suffer from depression. The cycle between bulimia and depression is constant, and one influences the other, making it difficult to address either disorder. Purging is used to, to respond to and control depression. However, the act of purging is, in and of itself, will leave the bulimic to feel more depressed. That combination, that in combination with malnutrition caused by self-starvation, will harm an individual's physical as well as mental health. As an example, poor nutrition may harm the, the body's ability to produce tryptophan, which can lead to mood disorders and contribute to depression, making it difficult to treat either without a positive change in diet. Among patients with anorexia, 33 to 50% have a comorbid mood disorder, such as obsessive compulsive disorder and social phobia. Those statistics are even higher among patients with bulimia, with at least 50% suffering from a comorbid mood disorder, like depression, and over half struggling with a comorbid mood anxiety disorder. One in 10 bulimics will also have a comorbid substance abuse disorder, like alcohol abuse. Additionally, those with eating disorders may begin to abuse over-the-counter drugs like sleeping pills and laxatives. Many will develop addictions to illegal drugs, hallucinogens, and prescription medicine. All of these statistics and numbers, they boil into one serious problem. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Every 62 minutes, at least one person dies as a direct result of an eating disorder. In anorexics, an abnormally low heart rate and low blood pressure will bring risk of heart failure, while severe dehydration can risk kidney failure. For, me, for females between 15 to 24 years old, the mortality rate associated with the illness is 12 times higher than that of the death rate of any other cause of death. For bulimics, the 
constant binge purge cycles affect the entire digestive system and can lead to electrolyte and chemical imbalances. Those imbalances can affect the heart and other major organ functions. Electrolyte imbalances can lead to irregular heartbeats and potentially even heart failure and death. Additionally, there's the risk of gastric rupture during periods of binging, while frequent vomiting can rupture the esophagus. There's the sharpness of breath. My assumption is it's nothing. But the sharp pain continues. Trying to find breath again. Trying again. Changing positions on the furniture and then the floor. The breathlessness persists. I check my phone, but my credit is at zero. I'm afraid I'm going to die alone in this home. I got a 911. I spent two years constantly anxious and depressed. So where were we? Hey, I was collapsing on the floor the last time we talked. So, that day was November 25th, 2014. I remember a lot of that day pretty clearly up until that point. I was visiting my family in Ohio and Thanksgiving was rapidly approaching. I was in charge of making a whole meal this year and was spending my morning making vegetable stock for my shepherd's pie. Like any other day where I was home alone, I had already been to purged a couple times. But then I started to experience sharp pain in my chest, leaving me with the inability to breathe. I situated and resituated myself into different positions all over the house, trying to find a position that would allow me to regain comfortable breathing. But I couldn't find it. After a while, I started to panic, and I reached for my phone to call my partner, who was also visiting the U.S. with me. Unfortunately, my prepaid phone service was out of order, and I sent a frantic iMessage to him to come to the house as quickly as he could. Realizing I couldn't make a call and still struggling to breathe, I dialed 911. Paramedics came to the house and took me to the emergency room. I don't remember a lot after dialing the emergency number. One thing I do remember is that they said my vegetable stock smelled pretty good, and that's probably the only positive from that day. From the emergency room, after running tests, giving me potassium and fluids, and letting me regain breathing, I was able to go home. It was that day I realized how much harm I was doing to my body, to my organs, and to my mind. When my life felt like it was collapsing, in reality, my body was beginning to shut down. Despite all my suicidal thoughts, my depression, and my anxiety, a switch went off in my mind. I really didn't want to die. Not from this. I was equipped with some of the tools I had from my six-week program and started working from that day forward on my recovery. With the help of my partner, I've worked every day since then on becoming a better version of myself. In those two years, with my relapse from bulimia, I lost a lot of friends. I lost a meaningful relationship. I lost a job. I lost the trust of my new colleagues from work. Not to mention the heaps of money and hours wasted on the binge purge cycle. It's been a lot to clean up after. And that's what I call paying off emotional debt. That phrase was said to me years ago by a friend and former colleague, Leon Gersing. He told me that all the lies, all of the stress, and all of the anxiety would eventually accumulate into one big mess that eventually I'd need to work off. That emotional debt, much like technical debt, must be dealt with. In some ways, speaking about this publicly is a form of active recovery. I've spent a lot of time thinking about how I hit rock bottom. The lies and the substance abuse. I really had become the worst version of myself, and I never want to be like that again. I know the risks. I know there's a good chance that I'll relapse again. But my hope is that if I talk about this with others, raise awareness, help others, it'll be harder for me to relapse. People will see. People will notice. Recovery and treatment is different for all people. However, only one in 10 people with an eating disorder will receive it. In men, those numbers are even lower because of the stigma that eating disorders are a women's issue. As members of the tech community, as individuals, as conference and meetup organizers, as team leads and company leadership, it's important for us not only to understand the issues that have affected our colleagues and friends, but to be advocates for and support those with mental health issues. As 
as individuals and as an industry, we're working to make tech a more inclusive and safe place. Eating disorders, unfortunately, aren't really a part of this. As individuals, you have a voice. You can be an advocate for and to support those with eating disorders. As members of an organization or as a committee, you can speak up to raise concerns, making sure that your org is a safe space for those who are suffering. Even in your day-to-day -day interactions with other people, you can be a voice. When you hear people making remarks on what another person is eating, when you see people making comments on the appearance of others, remind people that eating disorders are deadly. Remind people that it's none of their business. Remind people to be empathetic. Organized meals are a great place for us to make an effort to ensure inclusivity to not only those with eating disorders, but all mental health issues. It's popular to have companies provide on-site meals and snacks. Mandatory meals provided in-house so your employees don't have to leave the office is bad for all mental health. Those programs were developed to take pressure off of workers to allow them to think about the problems they're solving at work and not the problem of what's for lunch. But taking a break from the computer screen isn't as effective if you're still stuck in the office. Taking walks, changing locations, removing yourself for an hour might mean you're not cranking out work as quickly, but it also means you have the opportunity to step away from what's blocking you, physically as well as mentally. Regardless of the meals that are provided, whether in the office or at an event, you're putting people in a position where they no longer have options. You're taking away their ability to decide what and when they eat. Generally, when I'm put in a situation where work is providing me with lunch, I'm generally anxious, resentful, and will typically skip it altogether. Now, of course, everyone with an eating disorder will be different and handle these situations to the best of their abilities. We are all responsible for our own actions. However, given the shame about, given the shame and taboo that surrounds not only mental health issues, but especially eating disorders, it's difficult for people to voice concerns about eating situations. For example, last year my company was preparing to go on a team retreat to beautiful Barcelona, Spain. And as I was getting my things in order to leave, the schedule for the offsite arrives in my inbox. Upon scanning the events of the timetable, I see group cooking session as a team building activity. Immediately, I was hit with a panic attack. Though I've made a lot of progress in my recovery, to this day I'm still extremely controlling about what and when I eat. And now I see I've been thrown into a scenario where I'm going to be expected to cook food with strangers. What was I going to do? To my knowledge, all of the events were mandatory. Could I approach the person who created the schedule and say I won't be able to attend? But will I miss the fun? Will people notice I'm missing? Can I take a bunny with me and find other food alternatives for the evening? Would that be considered a boycott of the event? These are the things running through my mind as I cried and hyperventilated. Ultimately, what I ended up doing was attending the event. What that resulted in was another panic attack and me excusing myself from the building. It was a pretty embarrassing experience, and I wish I had skipped it altogether. If your company is made up of just 20 people, statistically speaking, at least two of your employees will have struggled with an eating disorder at some point in their lives. If your event will have 200 attendees, you're looking at least 20 of them with eating disorders. So, while this seems like a small minority, in reality it's more common than you think. Instead of offering a variety of unhealthy food options for your meetups and conferences, consider offering whole food options instead. Ditch the cupcakes and offer something healthy for the afternoon snack. Cater from your local Mediterranean or Thai restaurants for your meetups. This not only benefits those with eating disorders who rely on healthy food options, healthy options will help all of your attendees feel satisfied and alert. One of the best conferences to handle the What's for Lunch was 2015's Madison Ruby. Upon registration, each attendee was given an envelope of cash to be spent on lunch. This kind, of this kind of program essentially empowers people to make their own food decisions. I didn't have to be put in a situation where I had to hunt down a server to get my specially requested meal. I wasn't put in an awkward position where I was uncomfortable with provided food buffet. I was even lucky enough to have been traveling with a coworker who is aware and sensitive to my eating disorder. And so we buddied up with a few fellow attendees, and I had a great meal that I was totally comfortable with. These examples, they work great for events, but what can companies do to ensure their employees are being treated well with eating disorders? Much like any other health benefit, mental health should be a priority for your company. As a medically recognized mental illness, eating disorders qualify under the Americans with Disabilities Act. As managed 
managing directors or company leadership, you should familiarize yourself with the medical benefits your company is currently offering. If you're not offering mental health benefits, you absolutely should be. There are many mental health disorders that affect more women than men, so including women in these discussions will ensure that their voices are heard and those disorders are most likely to be covered. Once you've equipped yourself with plans and information to support those with mental health issues, ensure that those practices and information are transparent to everyone. That way, everybody is able to take advantage of their benefits. At Travis, we have some pretty transparent discussions and policies regarding mental health. For example, taking a mental health day does not count as one of our mandatory 28 vacation days. We are not questioned on the legitimacy of our mental health days. We simply want to see each other well. Happy Builders produce a better product after all. Additionally, we have started a mental health channel in our company Slack where we're able to discuss issues we're having, support fellow builders, and share mental health resources. While we're very lucky at Travis to have a small company of supportive colleagues, I know that model doesn't exist everywhere, and we don't, and it won't work in all cases. But it makes me feel better knowing if I'm in the middle of a mental breakdown, I can simply take the day off, catch up on reruns of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and decompress. But even if you don't provide a safe space for your employees to talk amongst each other about mental health, I strongly recommend you implement a no questions asked policy regarding mental health days. Mental health is just as important as physical health. Whether someone has the flu or having an anxiety attack, if they can't work, just give them time to recover. You'll have happier employees for it. There's a lightness in the air, the tinkling of silverware meeting a dish, a toast, an appetizer, a main, a dessert. I don't know if the toilets are private, and it doesn't matter. No regret. Just good company, kindred laughter, and a fond memory. This feels right, and I'm happy. Eating disorders, like all mental health issues, are serious and should be treated as such. I encourage all of you to begin thinking about how we can support those with mental health issues. Start conversations at your office, with your friends, invite people to speak at your events. As I said earlier, I'm part of an initiative called Prompt that sends speakers, such as myself, to events to talk about and bring light to mental health topics. If possible, get in touch with Prompt and invite someone to speak at your next event. Continuing these conversations is how we make a positive impact in our industry and how we treat mental health. What this all means, whether you're someone who's suffering or just another individual working in this community, we have one goal and we need to share in this industry. Think less about the technology itself and more about the people building it. Happy people build better software. For people with eating and other mental health disorders and the subsequent issues that generally accompany them, we need to promise to look out for each other. We can't build